Thank you, Brother Michael, for more than generous comments. I really wasn't trying to get more time, but the host giveth and the host taketh away. <laughs> uh, should I say, blessed be the name of the host. I want to start where Brother Ruffner ended. Uh, he had the antediluvian period, and we have the post-diluvian period. One before and then after the flood. And did not talk a great deal about the flood. Which in the minds of many, uh, you mean Noah and that old flood? You're going to refer to that? And yes, we are. Noah's name is mentioned in several places in the Bible. In the New, to talk about the coming of Christ and how he was a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, 5. And indicated in other things by way of implication. But a stalwart of the faith in the old. And I like to study the Bible from the standpoint of, uh, and I realize the importance of the dispensation of time. No problem with that. But somewhere around, uh, I guess 40 years ago, I began to write what I call the Davidson's Notes on the Old and New Testament for our children, to leave for them. On how, in my studies, not yours, uh, anyone feel free to study and put the Bible together the way that you wish to put it together, as long as it's the truth. And you can prove that. And so I started writing on how I think that the Bible uh, needs putting together. The Bible is one book with 1,189 chapters. And each book of the Bible depends on those before it or after it, with the two exceptions, the first book and the last. And by the way, Brother Blake, uh, you'd be pleased with Brother um, Keebles. So he got up and he said, uh, tonight I'm going to preach from kibber to kibber, from generations to revolutions. So he left off revelations altogether. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, I just I just thought I might mention that since, since it's been prevalent. But I, th I think we need to look at the Bible as one book and all the events that come into play as God's answer for the problem of sin. It is a book about sin and redemption. And many years ago we made mention of the fact that Genesis chapter 3, in my judgment, was the saddest chapter in all the Bible. And there was a lectureship a year or two after that, uh, uh, sad statements of, of the Bible. Uh, Genesis 3, in my mind, is the saddest statement of all the Bible. If it had not have been for sin, there would never have been a crucifixion. Had it not have been for sin, there would never have been the awful flood. It would never have been for sin, there would not be the death and destruction. And everything that happens goes through time, and only our Savior can undo what man did in the garden. That's the only answer for it. There's no other alternative unless you take being lost as one of the alternatives. We either obey to be saved or we reject and we're lost. Those are the choices that we have. And I'm so thankful and grateful that as it has been pointed out that we are creatures of choice. God made us to be free moral agents. And you remember how that Joshua 24 and 15, he said, choose you whom you serve, but for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Each of us must make that determination. Each of us has a choice to make. And we're going to answer for those choices. Now Noah was faithful in all of his house. And God spared three families, Noah, Miss Noah, and their sons and their wives, to go on that ark. And the waters came down and the floods came up, as we, say, as we have sung songs for little children's classes and so forth. And the fountains were opened from above and from beneath. And I was taught when we were at Freed Hardeman many years ago that this earth was a water canopy. In that canopy, there were no such things as seasons as we come to learn of them in the lesson tonight. There was a mist that watered the, everything. No such thing as rain. That was a foreign word. No one knew anything about that. 
if it was the case opposite of that, why would it be significant that Noah had faith when God said it's going to rain and you build an ark? What's that? I don't believe that. And so there we are. But Noah was faithful and God found grace, or Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord and he was spared. But all the others were not. And folks have been mentioned to and alluded to, please, if, if it's repetitive, please let me repeat it. Please pay attention to the genealogies. If we do not pay attention to the genealogies like Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 10 and 11, I know 11 goes into uh, Babel, Tower of Confusion, one tongue. God never intended for there to be a one tongue people or a United Nation type deal. That's obvious from the text idolatry, and whatever else existed. Don't skip the genealogy in chapter 10. There's where you're introduced to Canaan. There's where you're introduced when you study, for instance, in the Kings, Chronicles. Where did these nations come from? Turn back here to Genesis 10, you find out. Because Noah and his family start the same place that Adam and Eve did in Genesis 2 and 3, with one exception, Adam and Eve started within themselves, and Noah had three children and their wives and Miss Noah. He is starting all over again. And the earth was not without form and void in Noah's time as it was in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. It's for that form and void at that time. And the Spirit of God moved across the face of the deep. All of that was not so in Noah, but the flood. I do not know. I'm, I'm confident I can't. I'm confident I cannot imagine all of the forces and the power uh, of water. Uh, for instance, water will dissolve anything. There's an article in a recent uh, Popular Mechanics that I've been a subscriber to for decades, as far as I can remember. You can put anything in water and it'll dissolve it. Rust on a tool or anything like that. And the power of water. I have fixed Delta waterless faucets. Mowing. We've got one that you can't turn off without it turning itself off. If you walk away from it, it'll turn itself off. Well, I'm glad of that for the water bill. But you let a trickle of water start on a metal ball or a plastic ball, and what will it do? It'll go right through it. It'll, go, it'll create its own little course. In 1993, we had a terrible flood in our little town of Obion, Tennessee. 38 families were displaced. And there was tragedy. From that, there was a drowning uh, where a person accidentally drowned, looking for others, by the way, and himself drowned, not a swimmer. But the part I'll always remember, I preach this film, the part I'll always remember is that there was a man, his uh, grandma is our neighbor to the south, next door neighbor. And today he's an engineer, not the train, but of the tracks on CNN Railroad. Now, brethren, here's why that he's got the job he has today. He was running those other engineers. He didn't have that job then. Up and down the tracks, one inch of water can float a freight train off the rails. One inch. The power and the force of water. And we read in the scriptures of that water for 150 days. We know it's on the earth longer than that. 150 days, a period of time when the earth was agitating. The force of it, the power of it. And our, 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 the archaeologists today want to go back to the flood, maybe want to go back to Noah, but the flood stops them. They can't do it. They cannot answer the flood. Why? That many of them make fun of it. And all, well, of course, the modernists all deny that there's any miracles in the Bible. Flood and plagues and all of it included. And this is why maybe they allude to it as that old Noah flood. 
of that old flood? The flood is uh, significant. The purpose of the flood is to destroy evil in the land. To get mankind that has violated God's law off the face of the earth. And start over. But sin was not defeated. The earth was not cleansed of sin. It simply cleansed of hundreds, and we don't know the number. <laughs> cleansed of hundreds of sinners. And to start over on uh, or with a new leaf. In Genesis 8 and verse 1, God remembered Noah. And I want to make a few comments about chapter 8. And then I'll settle in chapter 9. Read the book and you'll find some of it and most of it you won't. But in chapter 10 and verse 11, don't forget the genealogy, don't forget the Tower of Babel, cube, confuse your tongue. I want to say a thing or two of chapter 8. I'll camp in chapter 9 a little bit. God remembered Noah. And the term God remembered is important. Had God forgotten Noah? No. I think in 1 Samuel 1 of Hannah uh, praying to God. She was without child and stricken in age. And she prayed if God would remember her and give her this child, which would be Samuel, that he would be, she would dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. Well, a Jew was dedicated for about a 20-year period. But he'd be dedicated all the days of his life. And in Judges chapter 16, Samson, of course, had God's pleasure for years and years and years. How many? I don't know for sure. But his eyes are put out. He's standing in the midst of all of his enemies. And in verse 26, he prayed to God. He said, just this one time, this once. Read it. Judges 16, 26, I believe. This once. Give me the strength. Give me the strength. This once. Remember me. And he could bring down this building on all of his enemies. Had God forgotten Hannah? No. Had he forgotten Noah? No. Had he forgotten Samuel? Of course not. But here we have God commanding Noah to go in the ark. We have the ark resting, finally. God remembering Noah. And telling him what to do indicated in a number of ways. You have God's promise, God's pledge, and God's command. And God's commands are always that way. They've been that way from time immortal. As far as man and our record is concerned, all the way back. God commands. There's a promise or a pledge. And those are important. The pledge to us today, or the promise is, forgiveness of all sins. The pledge of eternal life if we'll obey and live faithful to the will of God. In 8 and verse 4, the ark rested. The seventh month, 17th day of the month, the mountains of Ariad. The ark rested. This is to me a significant time. Noah for about a year. Without a hem, without a rudder, without a sail. He's been powerless as far as the ark is concerned. God has directed the ark wherever it has gone. And it was a universal flood, not local. Even though our dear brother from Oklahoma said in about 2001, he said when the flood came, western Oklahoma got an inch and a half. They're severely drought stricken this day, by the way. And to think about uh, uh, a little over 600 miles away at our home today, there were tornadoes. And trees all over everything. Our family's okay. Our brethren's okay at Hornby. I talked to one of them a little while ago. He said everyone's accounted for. The problem is getting the trees out of the road now so we can get to people's homes and so forth. But think of Noah, powerless. His obedience to God is all that he needed, trusting in God with all of his heart. And where could he go? That's not, his, that's not his thoughts. That's not his problem. God is the hem of the ship. God is the one's control of that. And finally, it rested. All the turmoil of the days of agitation, those waters. And a ship built like that, I'm told, will draw about nine foot of water. And here it is. 
and it rested. It rested on a mountain whether it was directed, not by him. On Mount Ariad. And why are people inclined, I guess out of curiosity, to try to find the place? Some say they found it, some others don't. They don't say they found it. But when Brother McClish and I and others were in the Bible lands, we learned, at least I did, he might have already known it, but he didn't say anything about it. If he did, I think he's as green and ignorant as I am, or was. Now I still am. Well, anyway, we learned that every place of uh, notoriety, like the house of Caiaphas, the place still stands. Uh, in Corinth, where whoredoms existed, a palace up yonder on the hill they can't even get to, dedication to those. Religious people have bought ground that's sacred and put up their buildings there. And so if they knew where the ark rested, some denominational outfit, like they have other places, many places, they would simply buy it, set up a tabernacle of some kind, and go from there. And by the way, they would sell us tour tickets as we go to see it. Genesis 8 and verse number 20, he built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. First time that burnt offerings or burnt altar is mentioned. Not necessarily the first altar, but the first one, first one mentioned. But think about the sacrifices that he made. The Bible now, this is opening the door for thousands of sacrifices that would come. We could not count them probably, but God knows. And the last time you read about sacrifice is in Hebrews chapter 10. The last time you read the word sacrifice. Here Noah and his family starting over again after that flood, cleansed of the sinners that were there, making sacrificial offerings, burnt offerings, and so forth. And that finally ends over here in Hebrews 9, or Hebrews 10. What ended that? All the sacrifices all the way. From that time, from, for even the altars of Adam and uh, Cain and Abel. All those offerings were only temporary. They could not take away the sins of the world. Christ once and for all in the holy place, not made with hands, and paid the ultimate sacrifice on Calvary. So it is not necessary that we read of sacrifices after the Hebrew letter, the word sacrifice. It does not mean that there aren't sacrifices made. Uh, there are sacrifices when will by the gospel, sometimes great. Uh, when we were in Russell, Arkansas, we began to work with uh, Arkansas Tech uh, University based upon a work that was similar to it at University of Tennessee at Martin, where uh, two hours of Bible could be offered in, uh, in semesters, free for people to take, and they could get two-hour credit for it. Had a young lady taking the class. Uh, her father was a deacon in the Southern Baptist uh, Church in uh, uh, West Memphis. She had studied the scriptures carefully. She was in my Bible class, the congregation we were working. And one Saturday evening, she wanted to obey the gospel. And I went out to Arkansas Tech and picked her up, and we baptized her into Christ. Tearfully, she came, and she said, My dad will not let me come home. I'm ostracized. I'm disinherited. She paid a great sacrifice for obeying the gospel of our Lord. Others of you know of records similar to that. Uh, finally, of course, he receded, and he accepted her back. For a long time, she was a desolate young lady living on a college campus a couple hundred miles or so away from home. But she wanted to obey the Lord. And whatever sacrifice she needed to make was what she needed to make. And we thank God for those who uh, make examples uh, uh, like that in, in our lives. And I want to skip to Genesis 8 and 22. Uh, God promised that while the earth remains, seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. I don't know about you, brethren, and I wouldn't make an argument at all about it. It's not worth that as far as fellowship is concerned. I'm not sure that the earth had seasons before this. With that water canopy, you understand what I'm talking about? 
there was seemingly a, 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 a temperature that was sufficient for everything to grow and produce after its kind. But that water canopy is broken up. Didn't know seasons. If there were seasons, we're not told about it, at least. It's not written in the record, the divine record right here. It's not there. But God promised Noah and his family as long as the earth remained. And he didn't say the earth's going to remain forever. He said as long as, long as it remains, seed time harvest, cold and winter, day and night, shall not cease. And from that time till now, and until there is no more time, we will have cold and hot, summer and winter, day and night, and shall not cease until time is no more. You realize, brethren, I know you do, that this destroys the political climate of global, global warming, global initi initiative, whatever they are. I mean, this last winter, we had winters like I remember in the middle and late 40s and early 50s. That was our typical in West Tennessee, Northwest Tennessee, where we live. And, and the, the cold weather, you heard them, the cold weather, well, that's global warming. And a couple of years from that, we were 105 for two weeks, that's global warming. If the sun shines, that's global warming. If it don't shine, that's global warming. Everything is global warming. A few years before that, it was the ozone layer. Well, that was politically motivated. We wanted to get rid of the typical types of freon. So we had, to, if we can keep, if we can get the free for freon, uh, exactly putting away the ozone layer, then that's wonderful. And, and then they decided, you know what? God makes ozone from the sun, and we can't destroy all that. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 7, Peter tells how that the Word of God was made, of course, by His Word. Look at Genesis 1 verse 3. God said, and look at Genesis, God said, God saw, God blessed. God said, and it was spoken in existence, let there be light, and there was light. God said, and He said, as sure as the world was spoken in existence by God's Word, He said the same is held in store by God's Word. Now, I do not mean that we should waste uh, the things about us. We should pollute, and, but that's not as important as one's soul. I don't believe in polluting the side ditches and stuff like that. But the global warming thing is just a political ploy and something to get our attention from our beloved Al Gore, Tennessee. Well, I shouldn't have said all that probably. In the case of Noah, in the case of Noah, it was similar to Eden, starting over. With a promise that you multiply and you replenish. The same thing that Adam and Eve were told to do in Genesis 2. To replenish. Dress the earth. Now he was not told to dress it. In verses 1 through 4 of uh, chapter 9, be fruitful and multiply. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. There's a difference, isn't it? Man was told in the beginning, Adam and Eve, they had herbs to eat. If they could eat meat, it's never mentioned. But Adam and Eve, I'm sorry, Noah and his family can eat meat. And you recall how that he took two of everything clean uh, in the ark with him? And yet he's told that there's going to be some enmity between man and the beast of the field. They're not going to be tame any longer. They're going to know that we're after them, so to speak. Animals naturally fear us today. Adam Clark wrote, he said, did the horse know his own strength? And the weakness of the miserable wretch who unmercifully rides, drives, whips, goads, and oppresses him? Would he not with one stroke of his hoof destroy the tired possessor? But while God hides these things from him, he impresses his mind with the fear of his owner, so that he is trained up for and employed in the most useful and important purposes. I like his comment. 
But you shall not eat flesh with a life that's in the blood. I could not begin to say enough about the blood. At Genesis, or Exodus chapter 12, uh, the Passover, the blood on the doorpost and the lentils. Well, chapter 12 of, and verse 13. The blood of animals sealed God's covenant with Israel, Exodus 24 and verse 8. Blood sanctified the altar, Exodus chapter 29 and verse 12. Blood set aside the priest in Exodus chapter 29 and verse 20. Blood made the atonement for God's people, Exodus 30 and verse 10. Blood sealed the new covenant, Acts 26 and, uh, Matthew 26 and 28. Blood justifies, Matthew, uh, rather Romans chapter 5, verse 9. And one brother, I've forgotten now which, spoke eloquently on justification. Freely justified by this blood. Justification of this, brethren, it's an acquittal. We're guilty. And God says, by all your obedience to my son and application of the blood, you're justified. You're acquitted of your sins. Freely justified by his blood. In whom we have redemption, remission of our sins. And by that blood, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Brings peace, Colossians 1 and verse 20. Cleanses us, 1 John 1 and verse 7. Blood gives entrance to God's holy place, Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Sanctifies us, Hebrews 13 and 12. Enables us to overcome Satan, Revelation 20 and verse 11. God gave man the responsibility and the right of a capital punishment. I'll not read these, uh, these verses, verses 5 through 7. You've got the uh, Bible and you can read those. Whosoever, verse 6, whoever setteth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. You can get a, a war over this uh, ver verbally. So, Some believe that capital punishment justified. Some do not. God authorized it. That has not been set aside. Paul reiterated those things. Read the first several verses of Romans, the uh, 13th chapter. The man that bears the sword is a minister of God to thee for good. It does not bear to blame. All right, take the word sword out and put in the word electric chair. Or hanging, I think. Was Kansas last hanging state? Anyway, I put hanging. A man who uh, throws the switch. My dad was on a, a murder trial uh, many years ago in the 50s in there somewhere in our uh, home county of uh, Gibson County, Tennessee. And uh, the jury found the person guilty of murder in the first degree. And three jurors were selected by, of course they volunteered for it, but uh, among the volunteers they were selected and dad was one of them. And he was to throw the proverbial switch, and there were three of them on the wall in the Gibson, old Gibson County Jail. And on account of three, or heave, ho, or whatever the signal was, they threw those switches, and no one of the three knew which switch was the main one to the perpetrator of the wrong. Rather than I submit to you, please, that if people knew that for punishment or capital crime like that, their life is going to be taken away, we may have less crime. God said it in motion, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And man does that by the courts. If he does that in a way that's legal otherwise, we're answering to what God said in motion after the flood. The post diluvian period, God said, take the man's life who murders. Difference between killing and murder. And the Bible recognizes that. Different ideas entirely. Now, the Bible teaches consistently, as far as I'm able to tell, of the matter of capital punishment for these people. Uh, and here's an interesting thing. In uh, Carbondale, Illinois, a few miles from us, across the line in Illinois, a recent bank robbery. And the perpetrator, with a knife now, we, don't, we hadn't had anybody to uh, come up with knife control, but we'll control guns from the top executive on down. But no knife control, but with a knife, he goes into the bank at Carbondale, kills two ladies and wounds another that wound up in Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville, he has been found, uh, alleged now, to have committed those crimes, and they say that he could be put to death. 
a capital crime for what he committed by our law. In verses 8 through 11, God said, I established my covenant, the covenant made for mankind and made with mankind. You and your seed after you is this covenant uh, made. He did something wrong or harsh in the flood? No. But he made a covenant that I'll never do this again. I'll never destroy this earth by water again, by flood. Therefore, it must be so significant. And why I said in the introductory matters, I'm not sure, I'm, I know I can't. I can't imagine. Uh, for instance, in 2004, I came out from under a duck blind in a boat to go chase a duck, and I don't know how it happened. But the boat got under me, and I'm in water up to here. It's awful feeling. We had flood stage on the river. Water in some of the places were 40 feet deep on the Obine River I'm talking about. That same year in December, I got a call from a neighbor, uh, though uh, he lived in Milan, Tennessee, quite about an hour away, and he said, a man has been hunting down there in my blind, and he's calling, he's falling through the ice. Can you go down and help him? My old son and I went off as Jehu the driver, driving to Himalay, wild, to get down there. Because our son had uh, two small children, two children, I said, son, you're not going to go on the ice, I'll go. And I went behind the boat, and I fell in. And I asked water, thick ice, and I was that water for 30 minutes, the power and the force of water. Folks, it's terrible. God didn't say, I'll never destroy the earth. He said, I'll never do it again by water. But 2 Peter 3, Peter said he'll do it by fire. The day of the Lord is coming, thief and night, when the heavens shall pass away with great noise. That is the atmosphere exploding. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. Oh, here's elements all around. The elements melt with fervent heat. The earth also, also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And now listen to the first part of verse 11. Seeing then that all of these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be? We had a wonderful meal at noon today. These sisters here always do a fantastic job. Some of that tea was sweetened. In order to sweeten it, they had to put some substance in sugar, sugar or substitute for sugar, and had to dissolve it. Every woman here in this audience knows what to dissolve something means. Earth shall melt with fervent heat, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. When our Lord comes, never to this earth, to set foot on this earth, when our Lord comes, it'll burn up. It'll melt. It'll be dissolved. The fervent heat. So he says, think about your life. What manner of persons ought you to be? What am I? And what could I be? And these are what we need to look at. Our host is a mean man. I should like to close with uh, three chapters of Scripture. I'll introduce them, read two verses from one of the chapters. All of us know, of course, Isaiah 53, the vicarious sufferings of Christ. The terrible ordeal on Calvary. As Isaiah looked forward, forth telling, to tell what our Master would suffer. And in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 8 and 9, he said, he rode in a little while, God said, I had my face. For fear of, for a moment, with everlasting kindness, for I'll have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Here's God's church in the wilderness. And a glimpse of the New Testament church to come. The 55th chapter of Isaiah says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Isaiah 53, the sufferings of Christ. Isaiah 54, as sure as the flood of Noah, so it is certain that the kingdom of our Lord will come. And Isaiah 55, an invitation. Come and seek. I thank you very much.